This meeting is being recorded. Welcome, everybody, to the Regeneration Podcast. I'm here. It's not who I'm here with, first of all. It's who I'm here without. And uh, Guido, it's actually the second time in a row. Michael Martin has only missed two of these podcasts, and both of them were you. And uh, you might think he's uh, afraid of you or something, but you know, obviously, we're all good friends. And he he is a victim of an ice storm in the upper Midwest. So what happens is in uh, in the north, we have temperatures get warmed and cold and a lot of ice freezes on the trees. And then you get just a slight wind and all the power is out. All the power is out. It comes down on the lines. And so he ran out in his truck and he got some cell coverage. And he called me yesterday to say it would be doubtful. He didn't think he'd see his power back on for a few days, but he desperately wanted to be here. Uh, this is the third in a series of uh, conversations we're having about what variously people are calling the machine. Our, uh, our guest last week, Paul Kingsnorth, calls the machine. He's written Guido a, a really excellent substack called the Abbey of Misrule, where for a number of years, he's been trying to get at this thing that seems to be dominating our lives from a bunch of different angles. He's quite brilliant. And uh, the week previous, Michael and I kind of introduced the subject. And now we're with you, Guido, and I'm going to focus on your, um, your essay called The Technostructure. I think the concept of the technostructure, the beehive, uh, the machine is implicit in basically all your works. But the, um, the technostructure is how you labeled it in an essay that people can find on your website. But I want to begin, Guido, by saying a lot of your work, you're a social scientist. I'd say first and foremost, describe that for people, but also why do you find, you seem to be frustrated with the social sciences. Um, the last time we talked, we looked at your essay uh, on Sicilianizing our Weltbeschung and um, you know, you're looking for ways around it. You know, one, a lot of our listeners would be familiar with Rene Girard who you know, on one level on the social sciences would say that unlike the novels of Stendhal, which I know he's not your favorite or Dostoevsky where you can see the role of imitative desire in triangles in terms of uh, you know, competitive desire that social science found it hard to get at these. But you're a social scientist and you find so little, uh, you have to, you're like a honeybee. You're looking for a little bit here and a little bit there. Uh, talk about your background and why you, you know, what are the big questions that social science hasn't gotten at? I don't know. Well, so social science is, um... Well, let's think of economics. Uh, I don't can't speak for sociology. I mean, I've I've taken some and studied some criminology. But anyway, economics is as 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 the French sociologist Bourdieu says is um, is state science. You know, science d'état. So it's a catechism, and uh, it's like a the, it's very close to the theology. It's 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 not a it's. It's not a pun or a joke, or it really is. It's some kind of a, it's some kind of, um, you know, materialistic theology where, through this training, you don't have to learn anything about anything. You're just pretty much told that uh, the system in which the system in which you live is the good one. Finally, it has arrived after many years of darkness and obscurantism. <laughs> and so they show you all these little and then you go through all these kinds of abstract mathematized exercises about you know they're basically verbalism that draw seeming realism from the world of economics but they're all they're all like pretty much you know it's crucy verbalism it's just games mm -hmm. what you really are doing is that you're not studying and you're not interpreting and you're not understanding anything you're prepared to fit in and to go work and according to your talents and you have to compete and to go find a place in this middle stratum of functionaries, what they call technocrats or you know administrators, it's called administrators, uh, and hopefully and and there and and take take your position for which you have not been prepared at school, but the school was not prepared for that. I don't guess you know at the seminary you need, they don't teach they teach you to become a priest, but they teach you theology theology first, and then you'll have to learn the job on the job. And mm -hmm. what economics is the same thing. And, um, and so for, you know, it's, it's a very much a middle class thing, you know, all parents send their kids to study this discipline, hoping their children will become successful technocrats. 
uh, you know, get six figure incomes and work in one of these positions. So mm -hmm. that's how it goes. But it's, you know, it's, it's very much, it's very much, a, a, you are plugged, you know, you are prepared to be plugged in into a system. If, if for some reason along this process, you are not liking what's happening as it did with me and many others who were forced into this course against their will, not all of us at 18 wanted to do this crap. And, uh, mm -hmm. and not all parents, even with the best of intentions, and we discussed this, I don't I remember before, um, even if they mean well, because they want their kids to earn money, because that's, a, that's, that's, that's very much, I'm thinking of, of Peggy, right, the, the Catholic. Uh, I know him um, well, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and modernity, the modern era is an era where they have, you know, what characterizes is they have pecuniarized everything. You're no longer attached to a certain kind of household system. Now you have to fend for yourself by way of procuring the money to survive. So, and this has revolutionized everything. And that's what we basically should study in political economy, but that's the great revolution, right? That uh, Bernanos also talks about re revolution. We have revolution. And that's called modernity, and it's the era of the robots. And so we're coming to our to our thing. And so every middle class parent says, "Very well, my child will have to be prepared and instructed so that he can, he or she can be fitted into a particular comb in this beehive where he or she will thrive." Because I don't want my child to to die to die. So a little bit like you you mentioned Pugui and Bernanos. Uh, where where are you going to? Uh, I've always said Bernanos, uh, where are you going for him on these insights? I mean, you're saying very kind of complimentary things to these, uh, the insights from these two, we would say kind of traditional Catholic authors. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, w what's our story? I mean, and you, you see this in, 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 in Poudon as well. I mean, the, school, the, school, you know, the French have several of these guys that are important. They said, well, back in, and, and Poudon says that we know this, you know, before modernity, there was no money. You belonged to a to a, a household and you a farming household, and it was a self-contained world. You didn't need cash basically to live. Everything's changed uh, after they revolutionized this. They broke these communal bonds and created the new world, the one that's been analyzed in so many books, and you know, amongst them, the one of the most famous is Polanyi's The Great Transformation, which is a classic. Mm -hmm telling about how you know by monetizing the monetizing economic relations uh, and how making um, money uh, land and work commodities the world changed okay the catholics are who have grown into this other world and have romanticized it uh, see this coming and say this is the revolution they call mm -hmm. it the revolution or whatever it is Bernanos call it the robots, France and the robots, and whatever. It's all the same thing. Marx calls it das Kapital, and 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 Thorsten Webern calls it the, the the system of business enterprise. But however it is, something new has happened, okay. and all these other visionaries call it the demon uh, mm -hmm. or the disciplinarian machine, and Foucault and all these other guys. What's certain is that I don't know. Towards the end of the of, so around 1700s, something new arrives. No doubts about that. No doubt. What is it? Who knows? Uh, you want to call it a monster? You want to call it a demon? I mean, that's fable-like language. It's suggestive. Is it, uh, it, does it really deepen your understanding of anything? I don't think so. But it's a fact. And, and, and socially, something has truly, as Bernanos says, revolutionized. And the only revolution, it's not, you know, the socialist revolution nonsense. The only revolution, and as Bernanos said this very perceptively, is all these old worlds that are just panting to jump on this new, you know, bandwagon of mechanized, uh, mechanized, technicized change, mm. because they see it as, you know, it's powerful powerful jump on it and command it not just mm -hmm. jump on it and be you know uh, into the meat grinder and, and be and be 
just uh, crushed by the cogwheels of the machine. No, you jump on it to control the machine from the control room. And so that thus begins this adventure. Where are we and so on and so forth. So, um, and, and, and I think the best, one of the best visions of this, you know, it's the, it's the first part of the movie, The Matrix, you know, where there is this, you know, dystopian um, a genius representation of mankind as in these pods with this virtual reality plugged into their brains and then being functioning as batteries needed by the machine to uh, feed itself. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, and so that movie plays very much into the hands of those who see the system as, you know, this is in, in, in the thralls of a monster uh, and of a demon who's come to, through the machine, to crush uh, human flesh. Uh, and again, we're back into the Foucauldian mythography. Mm -hmm. That's going to be a big part of today, separating that Foucauldian mythology from where you are currently. Yeah. How did you, if we're using as a touchstone, your essay uh, called Technostructure, I want to say too that like um, a lot of people write to me and say how enthralled they are with your thought. Like what you got to do is buy Guido's book called The Ideology of Tyranny, because a lot of this thinking is in there. Um, but the, uh, uh, and it's worth every penny, but the techno structure, this, this essay, which is a great summation of a lot of it, uh, a little bit of background that was, it was something you gave at the Vatican, right? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's an essay that was on my website. I'm going to revamp my website, by the way, and I'm going to plug also my new website, which is work in construction, but work in progress. But if you want to subscribe, it's called atriarios.com mm -hmm. and a so spell that for people. Yep. Sure, A D uh, T R A T R. I'm sorry, T R I A R I O S ad triarios.com. And I'll link it at the bottom of the podcast and tell people Fantastic. that name you told me once. It's a military kind of reference. Yeah, it's it's the third liners uh, of of the Roman legion when when battles came to a point where they were stalled, they would just open the ranks to come to let the most experienced fighters, you know, were basically butchers, resolve mm -hmm. things. I, I take that and I sublimate it, like the third yeah. liners in, in a spiritual sense. And so you go there and uh, subscribe, and then I'll send you all, everybody, all the information and everything. So a lot of stuff is going to come out in the next few weeks, God willing. And anyway, yeah, this 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 um, essay was there. It's slightly revised because it's been submitted to a journal in, in Russia. It was about La Delta C, right? The encyclicals. It was, you know, roughly connected. Originally, to originally it was a discussion of mm -hmm. Laudato Si. It was yeah, in 19, 2015, 2016, uh, the the Pope had issued this this uh, this encyclical about the environment. Uh, it was very uh, talked about, and so there was this there was a um, I don't know, a seminar and in Rome, and there was this professor from the uh, Normale of Pisa, which is uh, a really, you know, one of Italy's prime schools. And he came and, and, and he just talked about that. And I was a discussant of his piece. And this, my essay, very short, it's like seven pages. So it's like yeah. uh, very short, um, developed out of that. And, and yeah, this, 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 this guy, uh, this professor, um, whose name was uh, Fabris, I mean, I, I, and he, he also was very much enthralled by this idea of the machine and uh, at the time he was citing this he was citing this this fact this this phenomenon that struck him um that we observe daily when we deal with these little gadgets that we have at a certain point uh as we know your computer reboots itself or your phone reboots itself when you're online saying well wait now i i need to you know you know upload some updates so uh -huh. wait don't do anything. Uh, don't turn your don't turn anything off because I'm I the machine need to do a certain you know a certain kind of uh, maintenance and you I don't know go out and get yourself candy while I reboot and whatever it is. And he thought, think of that. I mean, it's you have you think you're in control of your own gadgets, but it's them who you know. It's like Al uh, uh, the you know the computer yeah. in two thousand one. 2001. So anyway, so a lot of people just, was it Al or Hal? I forget. Hal. H-A-L. Hal. Hal. Yeah, no. And uh, Hal. So, <laughs> so a lot of people are really mesmerized by this thing. Yeah, no, so it's true. You have these damn things and, and you're not in control. They're in control of you. I, 
No, no, I don't. I don't buy any of that, frankly. I see. I see. Uh, yeah, Steiner would say this is this is a demon that controls all these things, and he calls him Ariman, right? Mm -hmm. the, the the demon of uh, icy laws and mechanization and insectification of life, and all that is very alluring and and very suggestive. But for our concrete purposes, when we study mind control and and social control, because in the end that's what we where do I live? Who am I? How do I relate to others? And where, what is my position in society? When you ask yourself these questions, I don't understand why all people don't just go, don't go and think of the fact, hey, you are in what looks like a hive structure, a nest, mm -hmm. you are. And so start thinking in these terms. And as soon as you look at nests, you know, you see that nests are structured uh, more or less in variously. And so I see things, I should say, in pedestrian fashion. There's nests with their hierarchies. And for me, technology is just an artifact that has mysterious origins, no doubt, that has been used by elites for making that control even more stringent. Okay. Period. Mm -hmm. And people say, well, that's drab, unimaginative, and it doesn't really reach into more spiritualist considerations. And I may say, maybe so. I think it reaches, I, I appreciate all the spiritualist um, drifts and, 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 and spillovers from these kinds of things. But ultimately, I don't think that the machine controls us. I think the machine is there and it has access codes who are ultimately in the hands of very few people. And that's what concerns me most. So you're saying, think... you're saying the machine doesn't control us. I get it. It's more... And we're going to talk about how you think maybe the purpose of the machine is by definition to obfuscate or to make more hidden the control, the controllers. But you mentioned Steiner, and I'm, I'm curious here. You have some people who would just say the demon is technology. We look at Steiner, if I'm right, in other ways and say, no, like if we were to recreate a world, some people would say we just go back to um, non-electric farm implements. We live in small villages. Um, Steiner, in my understanding, would say, no, there's still a role for the, say, the assembly line in one sense. Like everybody's got to take out the garbage. This way of organizing work probably does have some benefits. And that you're you're distinguishing yourself from Steiner vis-a-vis -vis the aramonic impulse and technology in a different way. So is there a continuum of maybe these three different ones? I kind of would have cast Steiner not reading nearly as much as you have in somebody who would probably have maybe sided more with you than you're saying that technology is something we can eventually control. Say more. Well, um, how should I put this? Um, technology for me is, is, you know, it's what I don't, what I do not appreciate in the critics of the modern era is this, as I would say before, it's the romanticization and of, of, of pre-modern times. Mm -hmm. and it's like they put it as if before all this modern revolution came about, it was great. And the answer it absolutely was not great. It was a disaster. Mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was an endless carnage where they were doing abominable things. And that's what I, that's what I, uh, that, that puzzles me. And also. And you, know, you and Steiner and, would agree with that, right? Thus far? He would probably agree know, with you. I, I don't know what Steiner would say about yeah. that. What, what, what Steiner says, and it's interesting in his demonology, is that, which is the best I, I found so far, it's, it's still not, it, it's still too clean. It's too Edwardian in a sense, too Victorian. It's too prudish. But it's, it's much more, it's, it's more sophisticated than the traditional Christian one. It's, you know, he says there's two poles of evil. There's Luciferic and Ariman. One is Lucifer, and, and, and they're two different gods, which is great because in, in, in Christian tradition, they, they bundle them all into one and making us, it's a great confusion. How can they be all one? The demons are very, there's, there are many demons. Mm -hmm. And amongst the big ones, how can it be one? And if you look at their traditional name, one is called Lucifer, you know, bearer of light. And the other one is called Mephistopheles, which means I hate the light. So just, right, I hide from the light. So they're not the same person. They're not the same entity. So already that is like, 
unforgivable for, for Catholicism not to explain us what is going on here and saying, oh yeah, bills above, uh, Mephistol, it's the devil. N yes, and, and absolutely no. Agreed. In Steiner, you don't have that, you know. Lucifer is his own thing. Lucifer is, is the god of, you know, of, of the high, of the of the moistness and purulent matter. And Ariman is dryness and insectification and so on and so forth. And Steiner says, look, it's not that, you know, in the extreme and in pure forms, they're absolutely evil, but we are all composed of them. And then he says, then he just, he strikes his blow and says, and Christ is walking the mid path between them. And mm -hmm. you say, well, what does that mean? Well, well long discussion, right. but um, so, so yeah, I mean, all these guys that say, oh, modernity has ruined this, has ruined our morals, and it has desecrated this and that and the other. And, and I'm thinking, yes, and absolutely not, because before the era of the machines, our humanity was still obscene. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I see a lot of continuity. I, you know, I see a lot of continuity um, between the old world and the new world, and tremendous changes as well. And the continuities are just in what, you know, Tolstoy and whom I also cite in, in our conversations with this law of violence and the language of violence, uh, which is the only language and the only law that people truly speak and understand, despite their profession of being, oh, no. I had some friends, you know, I, I did, uh, I did a, a talk with some friends um, on the radio. In one of the guys that you, you met him in both Sainas, and anyway, he is a guy oh. named... Uh, and um, and really nice guys, and we're talking about you know Hitler and other stuff, and and they didn't like. I mean, he said he didn't like. He didn't appreciate how pessimistic I was, you know, because they're all like, you know, we believe we gotta believe we gotta speak the idiom of love. We believe in love, and we will succeed. And he was just telling me that and saying, we don't just back me up and say we will succeed. And I said, oh, of course, of course, and I love you too, and I believe in what you believe, but. I don't know. I mean, st stacked against us are our powers of, of of meanness and yeah. and genocidal meanness and organized so deep and mm -hmm. so entrenched that I don't see how we can beat them with our own forces un un unless they screw up and and light a, a bomb on, under their asses and make themselves explode, which for us would be great, but it just because out of their own screw up, we can only hope that they mangle themselves because for our part, with the language of love, I mean, they'll, they'll chew us. Let me, let me hang on that language of love thing because when I was reading rereading, maybe for the fourth time, your article this morning, you're gonna say uh, that, you know, I, I've, everybody here knows, I mentioned this John Cowper Powis a lot, but in his last five, 10, 15 books or something, he was always just trying to get rid of the word love. You know, he goes, it immediately implies the word hate. And we certainly saw that in the Trump campaign, right? You know, love Trump's hate, which only meant like, I hate Trump. Uh, it was it was such a confusing term. But you use this word, you're talking about Foucault, and you're saying that uh, a prolonged habitation to the dictates of an alien presence, of an inhuman presence, like that of the machine, which appears to have gained the upper hand over everything. And then uh, you're talking, uh, and you're saying the substance within human beings that could have stimu stimulated empathy itself, human interest, has been entirely emptied by the machine. You use the machine of its limp. And I think that's good language, better than this language of love. And you use that phrase, this language of love. Couldn't we possibly, as one way of kind of making a little bit of progress, clean up our language on that interest of human love versus human interest? Again, the etymology of interest is so good. You know, inter-being. Uh, like a going between. And I even had, it was an article I wrote from Mike Martin's journal, Jesus, the Imagination on Usury. Um, the word interest is funny too, but Thomas Mann and Dr. Faustus says in one of the passages, do you think love is the greatest emotion? And the answer comes, why? Do you know a greater one? Yes, answers Adrian, interest. Interest is the last thing we're willing to grant to one another. For the more we know about others, the more we're forced to recognize that they're not extensions of ourselves. We love people with all of our hearts, so long as we can conceive of them as shadows in the universe, which centers around us, shadows dominated by our sensations and feelings, not their own. And lately, you know, when we know that language is that powerful, uh, 
I don't think I use the word love at all anymore. I'll use like interest. Um, conversation, again, seems to have a nice etymology. But when you, in your essay, and you just brought up this language of love, I think it's so disastrous. You know, stop loving humanity and take an interest in some other person, find out that person's name, and we might start being able to get some headway. But these big ideas surrounding love will be the death of us, I'm convinced. Or, yes, well, what, what the passage you read, what was that? Was, uh, it was from Dr. Faustus. From Goethe? Yeah, uh, no, Thomas Mann. Thomas Mann. Oh, Thomas. Oh, Dr. Faustus. Yeah. I could never. Yeah. Dr. Faustus. Well, wow. Good passage. You know, that book, it's I great, read it right. twice, could, could never finish it. It's really tough, isn't it? I can't oh get God. all the musical references and things. Oh, my God. Yeah. Yeah. Thomas Mann. Right, right. But good. Wow. What a citation. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yes, I agree. No, but it's not that I disagree with the Italian friends of the North and, 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 and their communal thing. And right. I, I agree. But the, the, my point is that so long as we're constricted in this beehive, you know, so long as they they force, they shoehorn us into this world in which we live and they say, you know, now earn, earn it, make it, you know, or until you, 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 you know, or die or whatever. So long as, as that is the routine of life, I don't think, you know, I, I don't, I don't think we can pull it off. Uh, right. People are going to be, People are going to be driven with survival instinct, and 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 this this talk of love is is just it's it's illusory. Yeah, and I'm I'm really struck. One of the reasons it's going to be hard for me to make clear, but one of the reasons that originally drew me to your work continues to draw me to your work, and now we've done some you know work together, Guido, is that we we can get more precise about this. And after this question, I'm going to ask you to start now. Just describe the techno structure. But you know, my background is in you know, I work for the Catholic Church. It's a thing called a religion. But I, I think that the less we try to get into the nitty gritty and describe this thing to see how it works, who set it up, who's controlling the levers, let's start naming names and so forth. Then the, the flip side of that is that we have a, a gospel faith that is built on too much spectacle. You know, the proscenium arch, the iconostasis. I was talking about this with Paul Kingsnorth last week. And what a great interlocutor on this. But, you know, I work, I run a Catholic parish. But the, so in our tradition, the altar rail, that it seems to me that the less we can get specific about the techno structure, we just talk about love and these generalities, the more we turn to this thing called religion, uh, maybe to pacify us. But I find that in your writing, too, you're always how saying the state and the church, they finesse the anarchist instincts in us. That's a big part of your work, Guido, how these big institutions are kind of ingenious on finessing the instincts of us. And I think that if we can get precise, I find when we can get precise about the machine and the techno structure and the beehive, it draws out, I feel like more agency, you know, that there's things I can do as opposed to just maybe sitting in a church pew and saying like 15 paternosters and so forth. Um, and so that's a personal reflection on how I find your work liberates me and takes me back to not so much religion, but the liberating message of the gospel. So in your work on uh, Empire and Church, your book is forthcoming, and your essay on the techno structure, you're always saying these institutions know how to finesse and kind of reduce the anarchist instincts in the gospels, but also kind of of human beings. Say more about that. And then if you yeah. can, maybe just launch into a diagnosis of the techno structure, because I think that's part of its thing is to reduce this, you know, who we I are. Was, yeah, yeah. In, in, in Empire and Church, which is coming out, and I was rereading it, and, and there's a quotation by those French Maurras and the, the Action Française, the French, which is a movement that's now completely forgotten, but they were very strong and active at the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, they're, they're basically neocons. And uh, in fact, you know, and I write that it's amazing. It's like the, the neocons have invented nothing. This idea of why they really want the church and why they want the church at their service for purposes of social control. Because, and there's a, an amazing quotation by Moas, which is cited in my book, about the fact that, you know, that they, on the one hand, they need the Catholic church and they need to subdue it and to have it at their service as you know as an empire not that france was an empire it wanted to be but failed to be but as 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 a nationalist force you want to have the church because it 
prepares, it makes for good soldiers, you know, there's, you know. Uh, devoutness is your word, devoutness, right? Devoutness, ready to die. So it prepares them for death. So the sacrificial martyr-like uh, animus, it foments that. And at the same time, the Catholic Church is so encompassing and protean and, 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 and embracing because it has, because it also, and, and I wish I had the words here to, to cite it, but um, that quote is amazing, uh, how mean and perceptive it is, because uh, the Catholic Church, uh, it, it, it tames the insubordinate bent in a lot of people. Yeah. It does. Because once it has the trademark of that story, you know, a lot of people, a lot of the people. The trademark of that story. That's a great line. I had the single well, out. Just once, like, well, it's got, just it's like. It's got the brand just, name, yeah. Yeah, but just like the White House is the trademark of the flag. You know, you put that flag mm -hmm. on your lapel. You ain't a patriot. You belong to them. So likewise with the Catholics, you know, you, and you say, well, I'm a Catholic anarchist. Well, uh, you know, it's it's a tall proposition right there. But think of the power the church the church has. It it encompasses everybody because a lot of people, as I was saying, um, they 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 you know they 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 resonate with Jesus. And why wouldn't you, young, radical, um, rebellious, um, attractive, true, and truthful? There it is with this gang, and they're all like him, and they go and they go to Jerusalem and they raise Cain, and and the church has got all that. It's got the patriarchs, it's got the radicals all in its bosom, and and the Action Francaise of says, "Yeah, there you go. We don't like that, but uh, and we, it, that's definitely something that needs to be diffused." But at the same time, they were underscoring what tremendous power of organization and regimentation the church has because it controls those guys too mm -hmm. but in the end that's structure as well the church is structure and then the people who live under the shield of the church they are devoted why and this because the church protects them just like a beehive you're into a sub beehive and that sub beehive takes care of you somehow because we want to be taken care of because we are we feel so vulnerable uh, not all of us are star entrepreneurs who can make millions and and or patent something great and then you know feed our families and the sons and the children of our children. Very few of us, and so we need. This is why we work for the man. This is why we go and look for protection in one in one shelter or another, because. Mm -hmm. you, and and the whole story about you know Jansenism and and uh, and and the disputes about free will in the church. What were they all about? You know, they're and the rebels, the, the 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 those who said you know the predestinations. They were a way of saying no, you don't get to decide. You know, if I'm going to go to heaven or not, I'm going to create a church. You know, it was a way of saying I'm going to create my own beehive mm -hmm. because you had the expression of the church. There is no salvation outside the ecclesia. Right, which meant this, what this meant socially, you're in this beehive, you breathe, grow up, and, and live in this beehive under our direction. If you don't right. like it, go out. And a lot of people says, and I'll go out. And this is why they were called schismatics. What is a schismatic? It's a guy who has found a bigger patron who's going to make him build a different kind of hive. So, mm -hmm. there. So, yeah. the anarchist, the anarchist is like, can you really live? the anarchistic dream. In the sense, we are the most radical and the most deluded of all people. We think we can, and there's a way out of the beehive structure. In a sense, the biggest foil to this story is Junger's uh, figure of the anarch. Mm -hmm. And it's out of his famous, the treaty of the, uh, the theory of, of, of the forester. It's called it. Bush, it, Bush, right? I don't know how it's been translated in English. It's, okay. a, it's a booklet called "The Treaty of the Rebel," I think. Okay. An absolute, an absolute must, and 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 his viewpoint is like you know, and it's and it's a character you find, and also in his book Elmesville, which is this um, cup bearer, uh, or, or is or the bartender of the te of the despot. It's like insinuate yourself, you know, live live like like uh, live like a, um, a, a, a subterranean rebel inside the gears of the machine. You're part of the system, 
but even though do and be a cup bearer, do not be a protagonist. So you are a servant, but a servant of the great master. So you just make great cocktails. You're at the very top of the barman line and and uh, bartending art, and which is so you are close to power, but not so close as not being able to you know cut your moorings and go somewhere else should they you know want to decapitate your ruler and so on. And, and that's Junger's suggestion of realizing that you're caught in the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And but how do you survive? And how do you keep your integrity, your integrity, and your stoic uh, sense of self in the machine? And he says, "Be the cupbearer of the tyrant," which I think is complete nonsense. It Brilliant, is. because Junger is phenomenal. But it always goes back to this problem: How can you be free? What is freedom? Freedom mm -hmm. is to live uh, according to your inclinations and being able to support yourself in doing so. And so far, it has proven to be nearly impossible because power organizes things in such a way that you cannot do without a king, a pope, a prince, or whatever it is. Anytime you see people struggling for reform or trying to do different things, they always say, oh, yeah, right. We could write a grant at the European, uh, the European Commission. Oh, wait, I know this great guy. He's, 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 he's a, a telecom entrepreneur. It's always the same thing. <laughs> if I have to do it, you know, with my own, you know, pulling myself from my own bootstrap, forget. No, it has to, you know, let's get a grant from the uh, National Science Foundation. You know, it's like. Yeah, that's why I think your work is so important, because when you uh, when you analyze the machine in detail like you do, I find that for me, you look at it, you look at those gears. And I think we all get a sense of we need to throw like some mud in the gears and maybe Junger had that same notion. But what it gets to me is this more anarchistic gospel because I think of throwing, you know, mucking up the gears and it, and it reminds me of the words humility, you know, hummus, dirt, and humor. You and I talked about it, that maybe anarchist literature could use a little more humor, you know, but I think the great foil to the machine might be that it takes itself so seriously that it needs something of a court gesture. And you're, you know, you've read everything in anarchist literature, you're not finding too much humor there. And again, that's why I've landed on Powis. He's got an anarchist instinct and he just cracks way, me the I, hell up. I've ordered the book. It's coming to me. There's, it's, 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 I get it. Moral strife. Flavor. I've ordered it. It's coming okay. from England. Speaking of humor. Yes. And you, and yeah. you, you started about throwing muck in the gears. I'm going to open my book on anarchism. Yeah. I, uh, based uh, after I've translated Lombroso and I'm going to go into my commenting essay with a tale from the Roman, from no, late Roman, um, you know, humorist, uh, is a poet of, of the um, late, uh, was it, early, early 1900s, uh, called Trilusa, who writes in Roman vernacular, and he tells the story of the anarchist flea. Hmm. And it's great. So there's this and and I'm going and and that's going to give the whole tone tone to my to my essay. Great, great, great. Yeah. And so the story of the anarchist flea. So this is anarchist flea, who one day gets inside the uh, uh, cog wheels of a very fancy uh, watch, and um, and um, and the cog wheels are telling to the to the flea, you know, and, and I remember and the flea asked, so what are you doing? Well, we're here laboring, you know, and doing this horrible, we're leading this horrible life as the cog wheels just to make, you know, the hands of the watch appear. They're all like, you know, in, in, encrusted with diamonds and to go around the dial and they look good. They have a good life, but we, you know, underneath are just like, you know, going through the motions of this life. And then we croak and that's that. And, and that's horrible. And uh, I says, oh, you know, and, and, and the flea was like, I, I thought this was amazing. And, um, and so the, the wheels tell the flea, why don't you just make us a favor? You, you look like a bright fellow. Why don't you just jump in the gears and um, jump into the mechanisms and, and block this whole thing so you can give us a respite? Uh, and, and so the flea says, okay, I'll do just that. And so the flea jumps into the gears, squished to death. And to death. what happened is that the gears start, you know, nothing changes. The system, okay. the, sy the system keeps, you know, rewind. Now you rewind, it keeps going. But the difference is mm -hmm. that the hand of the minutes is about 10 minutes slower. 
And, and so the moral of the fable is it still keeps going, but it's 10 minutes slower. And wow. so that was the, wow. uh, that was the finale of, uh, of Toulouse. Maybe I, I, I think of that, uh, you know, I rewrote this week about Gustav Landauer, this kind of interwar German anarchistic centric kind of genius who was appointed the education minister in the short lived, was it called the Bavarian Republic, Guido? Or? Yeah, the Bavarian Council. It was the second yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They had he, uh, five days. Five days, yeah. they were all there, yeah. That's a pretty good run, probably longer than the, the life of that flea, right? It's it's the only it's the only moment, yeah, we had yeah, Landau and Gazelle with his money, yeah, that's yeah. when it happens, yeah. Yeah, and he wanted he wanted every child to to have memorized yeah. certain segments or a lot of Walt Whitman, and he again Walt was Whitman like the flea, stop, stopped to death really quickly in, that, in those five exactly. days. Exactly, and, and, and abolish, ab abolish the, of history classes. Oh, good, 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 good. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so tell us, tell us about the techno structure, just kind of launch into it. Like, what, what do you, how do you see it operating? And then, you know, we certainly want to get to the, the fact again of uh, your recommendation to defeat it is nothing short of as radical as Landauer and that flea, but you're going to ask us, and we'll get to it, you know, that we need to eradicate within ourselves this, um, this prepotence, this, you know, predatory instinct. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think our listeners are going to find it hard. They're going to think it was always this way, this predatory instinct. But you, you quote a little in your article, and I'm trying to give you a lot to reflect on, you know, that we're so spiritually debilitated. Like, why would we think we're more spiritually debilitated than others? If you can put any of this in a historical context that helps, you know, are we more or not? But just kind of launch out into this, maybe your essay and what you see of the techno structure. Yeah, just to make a long story short, anyway, I'm just I'm just thinking about the things that we have all been told and taught, you know, and in and, and, and the social sciences, it's all about, but also in public debate, oh, private versus public, uh, what should we do? You know, the biggest thing, you know, whether you're more pro, then you're more libertarian, you're more, you know, free enterprise and more state, you're, I don't know, whatever. Uh, mm -hmm. You're more communistic or you know, Soviet communist and all that old, and that was more Cold War type of language. But so all of that complete nonsense. Um, it's for me, if you look at it, it's it's one machine. Uh, whether some whether whether it's publicly owned or not, in the end, does not make much difference. It's more a question mm -hmm. of how things are more or less efficiently run to achieve. But it's it's a techno structure, meaning it's a one it's a one ball, and um, and I wrote this also in my book on church and empire. Why don't we just look at these things and and call human nests one techno structure of 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 one form or another? Some are much more advanced than others, but they all are alike. They all strive, going back to Bernanos, to be as technically efficient as possible. Look at the Italians who want to best. Even the Americans at the uh, at their um, uh, online management, if the Americans have introduced, I don't know, the classic use of one or two passwords, the Italian have to have four, uh, <laughs> and it just gives you an idea. It's like, whom do you think you're fooling? I recognize you, inefficient eyes trying to be what you are not anyway. And what's even crazier, and forgive me this tangent, is like. In a country of people who are so old, right? The average, when people don't make babies in Italy, it's all old folks. They think that they're gonna modernize the system where their public is made of ancient people by giving them apps with 16 passwords, a nightmare. And goes to show again, the complete inefficiency and disastrous mindset. I did, I did not know that was happening over there. Of the Italians. Yeah, uh -huh. my aunt is desperate, but my aunt, I am desperate. It's like, okay, first password, second password. Now look at your phone uh, to receive 16. But it's like, it's it's like in the US, but 10 times more complicated. But, wow. But you could tell it's not because they're original. They're doing exactly, they're taking the protocols from the Anglo-American system and just making it thicker. Yeah. Um, anyway. Where was I going with this? That was so, great. Yeah, many yeah. anthills of different forms, some more advanced than others. And um, where the public and the private sector are basically one thing. Mm -hmm. and, and all this talk of these libertarians of too much government, complete idiocy. 
you know, even, a, even the, the Nobel Prize, Herbert Simon, in a book from the 90s, uh, and I have to look at this research because it's really, really seminal and, and interest, interesting, and I want to see how to repropose this 30 years later, was saying that, and I have the book, but I would like to know what kind of basis he has to say this, but not basis, to, to, to continue to consult what he did to see where we're at now. He says, what public and what private sector? He says, 20% mm -hmm. of GDP goes through the market, market transactions, 20 Wow. Like basically nothing. Mm -hmm. It's all already, you know, commissions and structured orders that are, you know, that drive the economy. Right. right. So this myth of the market that the, the libertarians and the neo Austrian schools put out there has nothing to do with reality. It, it has. It's more of a homiletical, um, pedagogical uh, purpose for, you know, con, you know, it's part of a, it's part of a, um, of a catechism for the belief in the market and to and to make us um you know and, and to make and, and to reconcile ourselves with this idea that uh this is the only way with which we can live by procuring money which successfully on the market and you so also say that that austrian economics that discourse is one of three discourses that is yeah. handed on to us like the, it's one of these three anti-system discourses that were you know that within the machine, they give us the anti -system. Yeah, anti anti system pro system discourses. Right, exactly. right, right. So right, it's part yeah, of yeah. that cardinal uh, cardinal bishop Landa confuse the subject in order to make him even more pliable. Yeah. So yeah. So so you got private, you know, private and public one with different kind of administrative regimes matters not. An elite anointed variously could be a king an oligarchy or whatever, but uh, and then you have at the bottom fanaticized termites who are see themselves as custodians of the systems and paragons of virtue. Mm -hmm. Your average, your average person is it looks himself in the mirror and says, I'm I'm such a good guy. Say and, more about and, that. That shows up in your writing a lot. And I think it's yeah. it's always jumped out at me, but they uh I it's grown on me because that's a that's a similar line you're going to use in so many different places that there's something about us. How does that differ from traditional Christianity or something? You know, we look in the mirror and we just think, you know, a lot of us will think it's the woke. They think that. But it's also not just those people we call the hyper woke. What led us to like do this, that we just look in the mirror and just think I'm so good? Is it the, the notion that we all believe we're on the right side of history because we have the right opinions and things or? No, I think it's we are we tell ourselves we're the good guys because it's a way of making us comfortable with the the position of privilege that we've mm -hmm. reached in a system that we recognize being completely unjust anyway. Okay. We see we I think we see how iniquitous the system is and unjust. But you know, it's like who gives a damn? You know, well, what about you know, those poor people and whatever? Uh, I'm so good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I am good. And for whatever reason, I managed to have this position. I know that I'm privileged and fortunate, but it's also because I'm good. <laughs> I, like I, it, yeah. I am good. And it's, it's the usual, it's the usual predestination story. And deep down, I kind of deserve usual, it. Okay. That really helps the usual predestination story. I think that's great. Yeah, because yeah. deep down I deserve it. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, for me, it's, it's, it's a dilemma because I know I really don't. Uh -huh. I know I'm not that in incredible a person, and um, I, I really know that. And and uh, I tell myself, I, but you know, yeah. And so I'm struggling with this. But from the viewpoint of the system, you have to ingrain in your subject this idea that they are paragons of virtue, because once they do that, they are completely with their with their with, with their nails, you know, attached to their position, knowing that they've earned it, that they deserve it, and that they're going to protect it. And that means protecting the system as a whole. Yeah. And, and they're so, so easily, you point out, so totally easily shepherded into any cause that's handed to them on a silver platter. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So the, so, uh, say more. Yep. No, no, that, that's, that's it. Yeah. And so, so that, the that's, a, that, that's the techno structure. That's the techno yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's that it's a nest. Mm -hmm. It's a highly structured, it's a highly structured nest where the elite wants as much control as possible. So it was why, you know, it's why we read this stuff and Gerald Hurd and it's why I'm interested. Oh, the Mayans control kept a very tight control thanks to this fixation with astronomy, maybe. 
also, but there was also these codes that Burroughs talks about. So it's not all astrology, but yeah. definitely the astrology. So for us, what is it? What for us Westerners? What is the equivalent? What is the equivalent of the Mayans' astronomy? I You're going to say it's these anti-system discourses, right? Where all three of them, whether it's uh, Marxism, Austrian economics, or the focus of your book, the ideology of tyranny. This kind of postmodern discourse, and the one thing you're going to say they all have in common is to hide the fact of power. It's always, always, according to you, economics. So say more about that. Yeah. So when when you're in a system like this, which, despite all its efficiency, more or less, depending where you are, certain, but but where you can clearly see where the advantage, well, enough, where the where the iniquity is, who has the money is and how it works, then, you know, to placate that kind of cynicism that comes and may harm the cohesion, you got to feed stories to the people. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the most famous anti-system stories, which you are fed at school too, seemingly out of equanimity, out of equanimity, it's like, oh yeah, yeah, no, no. I mean, at school, you know, you you study, we, we give you all the tools you need, you know, to learn and you're going to We decide. know our own problems. We know how bad we are. Yeah. No, we know how bad, we know how the system is corrupt. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. uh, and one of the, you know, and so and these ones, the most famous ones, the, the most famous of all and still successful, it's, it's Marxism. To this day, it survives. Not as strongly, at least in, in Europe always. In the US, a little bit less, but still. But to this day, we still have people who say, Marx, you know, great genius. Yeah, yeah, he understood everything, it's, and so on and so forth. That's one of them. Um, on the more extreme side of the pro system, you got the Austrians, where the market is God, and your success on the market is not only proof that you earn, as we're saying, where your position, but it's the only way of assessing, uh, of, 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 not assessing, it's the only way of realizing and concretizing what you know social status should be and how it comes about so if you succeed on the and, and, and so and the market is this magical thing which allows you to prove yourself and and it's more and it's more complex and more interesting because in the critique of more market and less state you tend to think that these guys are radicals but it's also pointing at the fact that in the organization of the system itself at the elite level it is true also that certain parts complain against the share that the state takes out of them. And, and they come from that, um, which, is, which, is an interesting, which is an interesting twist on the story. Because if it's true that the state is there to organize the power of the people, the powers, it, it organize the, and, and, and hold and, and, and support and shore up the privileges of the rich, it itself creates a structure which draws and drains resources away from it. So part of that polemic is inside the system as well, but in 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 its in its in being beamed out to the crowds, uh, this it, they, like Marx, like in the Marxist system, there is no mention of the importance of the state. Actually, mm -hmm. for the Neo Austin, the state is a noxious thing. Which is kind of a, a hypocritical thing to say because it's nonsense. There would be no market if it is not by fiat of the state. Mm -hmm. So, and any and regulation is just, well. We don't want any regulation. What does that mean? Not wanting any regulation is still regulation. And who issues that? It's the state. So they are they are mystagogues and they are uh, and they're mystifiers. They confuse. They are lying. They're not saying how things are. They're giving you a false uh, portrayal of society. And then there's the Foucauldians who uh, tell you that, uh, yeah, likewise, uh, the state uh, is, uh, is, is, doesn't exist. There is no power. What you call power is the interaction of this monster, the disciplinarian machine. So we're going back to the matrix and the demons and all that kind of folk tale type of style who tries to, sinks, tries to sink its hooks into fle rebellious flesh. And out of this violent, you know, throbbing and, and, and reaction and aggression and counter reaction of this um, fight between 
the cogs of the machine and the rebellious flesh of criminals and, and, and insane people comes the so-called definition of power, which is even more, uh, even more, how should I say, preposterous than what the Austrians are saying. And it obfuscates even more because it goes by the same name power, but it completely obfuscates like how this thing is, the game is played. Even, even, even it's not even, it obfuscate, completely obfuscates, but it, 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 again, it's it's sophistries. I mean, it, they, mm-hmm. they just, they just, uh, they just play with your mind by throwing at you images where again and and i admittedly foucault did it with this with this genius this is genial um this genial scholarly metaphor of of its commentary of the the painting las meninas right uh velasquez where that famous painting where it's from the viewpoint of the king and the queen mm-hmm. that are being the painted and so you see, you see how they're posing for a portrait by the fourth painter, but it's from their viewpoint of the, of the models, and so you see what they see in front of them. So there's like you know the retinue uh, um, retainers here and there. There's the midget and the dog and the painter, and at the end of the room, a circular mirror in which you see small, small, small the king and queen. And Foucault mm-hmm. comments, he says, here, power rules by the power of its absence. Hats off. Beautiful mystification. You know, mm-hmm. really very talented. Complete bullshit, but uh-huh. super creative. Like, power rules by its absence. Yeah, I get it. You know, it's very erudite. You got this painting. And you play with words. <laughs> and you, you know, you're, and you're suggesting, but you're, you know, you're, you're mind screwing with us. And so, but either way, all of these remarks and the crazy Austrians and the completely corrupt Foucault, an academician of France, by the way, right? You know, mm-hmm. super, te- you couldn't be more tenured than Foucault, go figure, what a radical. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what they say, power doesn't exist, don't bother. Don't bother. There's, no There's no power. What? Marx says, no power, it's our structure, superstructure. Yeah, we'll just conquer the means of production and then power will, de- and then the state will dissolve. What? Isn't this another version of that same old thing about, uh, you know, monkeys typing on typewriters coming up with the complete works of William Shakespeare, right? You know, that it's, it's uh, just another notion of shit happens. Nobody's ever done anything. Nobody's ever had a bad idea that hurt a lot of people um, and things like that. You know, power, power like shit just happens. Yeah, or just let's put it this way: people were in charge of the house. Mm-hmm. They, you know, they commissioned works from these talented hacks to tell lies to the public. Right, and right, right. so it goes. Mm-hmm. And I was, and I would want I, this. Is another thing that I want to that I want to refine in my book on anarchism, which I really want to be a big, big statement uh, for me. After all these years, I, I'm really, I'm. I'm treasuring the, the the gestation of this book and i really want it to be something good when it comes out and uh, there is a piece i think all your books are pretty good by the way go ahead <laughs> well thank you no i okay. this one this one's special i okay. and i, I and maybe maybe it will be the worst of my books but mm-hmm. i don't know i'm just building a lot to and anyway so there is this you know eric from right yep. frankfurt school they say this guy was paid by the cia by the way i have really? to look into that uh-huh. But I, most likely, it's true. In Frankfurt, the CIA has been funding the Frankfurt School and made them famous. Very likely, I should know about this, but I don't. Mm-hmm. But I'll read into it anyway. I like. I have to say, I like reading from. He, uh, he is not my favorite, and not the most, you know, not the not the, not the most perspicacious of, of of writers, but not bad at all. For what I for, for the few things, it's okay. Uh, and there's this book on Zen. And did I mention this already? No, Zen and Buddhism, and he has this quote, which I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll just reproduce it in the book because nobody, I can say it better. Where he says, "Yeah, yeah, essentially, nine point nine books out of ten are written to favor or to cover up or to uh, sustain or whatever, or to promote or, or reaffirm or." Uh, corroborate the rule of a very few over the mass. For sure, yeah. 
So, and it's like, yeah, doy, yeah. But still, I mean, right. So, so, so in other words, you spent your life reading. Most of what you read was garbage. Mm -hmm. Because if he is right, and he is, you have spent your life reading garbage. Maybe one, one book uh, out of 100 was, had some truth. So yeah, right. that, gives, that gives you an idea of how little truth you really know. Mm -hmm. You say, well, I'm a very, I'm a well-educated person. I've read a thousand books. Yeah, well, you've read a thousand pieces of trash. And so you, you're a very knowledgeable trash uh, uh, scholar. But so if, if, so if that's the case, then, you know, well, if that's the case, what, is that, what does that entail? So if everything is, so it, it goes back to what we're saying. So if, and that means that in the past was the same mm -hmm. before, you know, and in, 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 in those cases, it was, it was, it was overt. People were open, you know, the four pages of dedication. I dedicate to his, his majesty, the greatest, the most glorious, mm -hmm. the most stupendous, uh, mm -hmm. grand duke of this. And, 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 and thank you and for feeding me. And, and so, all right, that's your treatise on political, on political theory right, dedicated right, right. to the uh, you know to the margrave of whatever so okay so if that's the case then uh so it's always the same story yeah yeah let me so let me ask can, you go ahead tell me yep. so how can you how can we uh how can we write a theory of power that is not commissioned by those guys mm -hmm. so this is what we're doing this and we're uh, doing. i hope we'll be able to do a good job and not write something that's just trivial. That's what when, I'm when, afraid. Of. When, when do you hope the book on anarchism will come out? <sighs> when will it come out? I don't know. I hope June, maybe. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this damn house is. But finished. you're going to have again. You're going to have about three books before then coming out, shorter but very important. We'll talk about those at the end. Let yeah. me tell me because we have we always have a lot of Catholics listening to this. I myself am a Catholic. You've got a you've got kind of a seminal. I don't want to say a role, but Pope Benedict recently deceased since the last time we talked on this podcast and now uh, Pope Benedict has passed mm -hmm. away. But, um, you know, having being in the fold, something that so many of his fans hold up as just being so important and a monumental moment, you know, where the church spoke to the world, you know, you hold it as, you know, an epic fail in other words, but it was, it was, uh, you know, Pope Benedict's foray into the politics of diversity. What did he say and why is it so wrong? Could you remind me what, oh, yeah, the, the relative, oh yeah, it's debate with yeah. Habermas on relativism. Yeah, or, or it could be the Regensburg address and so forth. That, that same type of, uh, I would say that same type of cultural critique, which might be similar to say Jordan Peterson's, you know, cultural relativism or cultural Marxism. Why does that not, why does it do more harm than good? I don't know. I remember Benedict getting into a uh, getting into some kind of a um, diatribe with Islam at one yep. point. Yep. Then he had a dialogue with Abermas. I read about it and I forgot it the moment I read about it. I don't know. And um, and then he had and then and 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 then yes. And then he, they felt he and his team of theologians felt the attack which the U.S. was had been mounting ferociously. And very skillfully against them using Foucauldian discourse. And when was that? Well, well yeah, when he was Pope. Mm -hmm. But and uh, yeah, they they completely misunderstood, you know. But they they took they took Foucault, they took Foucauldianism for relativism, which is what it appears to be when you first study it. But it, it's when when you when you're ignorant of it. But that's it's not what it is. And so they were just they didn't understand. They didn't understand that this has nothing to do with logic or right. or, or or reason argumentation. This is just a battle for supremacy that is waged through uh, imagery and folk tales. And um, and so, yeah. And so what the Foucauldians, what the Americans were doing with Foucauldian language they were just, you know, uh, they were just accusing them, the Catholics, of being the last bastion of the disciplinary machine. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and it Geronto allowed, as a few sitting Catholic, it allowed 
so much of the Catholic talk outside of just theology and dogmatic and so forth, just to fall into the same old uh, worn paths of the culture wars, right? You know, yeah, cultural relativism. So. Yeah, yeah. And so I, it just, uh, you know, it led to more animosity. When Pope Benedict said it, he was trying to make a stab. But sadly, it just kind of, it, the way it played in Peoria was uh, the conservatives loved that approach. And the liberals said, again, this is the Catholic Church as the last bastion of oppression. Um, and then, you know, one more, and then we can kind of go far and wide for a little bit too. But at the end of your essay on the techno structure, you're going to, in this essay, you're going to call it the new humanism. So I'm going to say, people listening could say, so, you know, what is this preparata? You know, where are we pointing to? And you're, you're going to say the new humanism and, um, you know, it will have to issue from a re-examination of our psychosocial frame of mind and then, thence, uh, and thence of the social political structures, unfailingly oligarchic and elitist that have been systematically um, built on those particular spiritual foundations. So, you know, the notion of what are we to do? I have a sense that, like I said before, if we take your analysis in detail and we look at that machine, that beehive, that techno structure, something to me says that the gospel, the kind of the anarchist Christ, a little more humble position for the church could muck up the gears a little bit. Um, and you're calling it the new humanism. Again, you're using this language that we've been so spiritually debilitated that we're ushered into every new war, cultural crusade, actual crusades and wars. Define this kind of new humanism. And you know, one time when I interviewed you, I think for Front Porch Republic, you, we spent about 10 minutes on this, but um, this frame of mind of uh, the predatory instinct has it always been with us in this degree such that we might be able to eradicate it? Because a lot of people are going to listen to what you would say and say, I don't know, Guido's telling us to get rid of original sin. This is what we're saddled with. This is why I go to church. Yeah, well, good question. I, I, don't, uh, I don't know. I, um, I have, what, what for, for me, what the most important thing, yeah, uh, original sin. What I have a really, what I have a problem with, with is is as i was saying before is most people think that they're paragons of virtue you know mm -hmm. um they, so this is this a little what's that well i think we can begin with that yeah that we're i think no i don't know it's it's, it's, it's you start you know, there that, and it's very interesting yeah well, they always do this shtick you know sometimes i found myself this thing it, 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 these guys that always do this shtick but uh they always do oh if if i had a if i had a pedophile a pedophile in my hands no, I did. I did this. I do this, but I no, I, I don't, maybe once. I think it was for front porch, but yeah, I like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do. I say this all the time. Yeah, if I have this pedophile in my hands, I don't know what I would do. To, you know, this kind of thing, and I don't know why they do this. And I'm going to get to my point. It, it, it's an act. So, is it because they want to seduce some women in the in in the audience? They want to look like you know the mm -hmm. strong male. And I'm thinking. Yeah, you of course, but then it's the very same people who hear about all sorts of monstrosities done and then you know committed by their you know their army or and and they don't flinch or their political tribe or something, right? Yeah, whatever. It's like yeah, but 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 then what? Certain things they 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 they, they do this thing and I don't know. Um, my my uh, literary friend, the Stephen Bisenci, who died a few years ago, he phrased it thus. He said, you know, um, because I know I would jump in a front of a car to save my child, you know, that gives me permission to commit a thousand little, you know, sins of malice, you know, and so mm. forth. You know, it's the same musical register as what you're talking about, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, completely. Or, or it's the same people who will say that. And then you mention Nagasaki and you say, yeah, that was totally right. You know, the, uh -huh. the, the, emperor, the emperor didn't surrender. We had to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm thinking... But it, it's the same thing. It, it's all again. It, it's an we're app. sending like ten more billion dollars to Ukraine right now. Yeah, or whatever. You know, they 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 back up any kind of genocide, but then but then they act these 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 moral champions. Mm -hmm. Um. And then also, of course, classic thing. You know, and people will say to me, "Yeah, you want to do this, you want to do that," but human nature, being what it is, you'll never be able to. You know, another classic. A conservative repartee and um i don't know i don't know i i and it's 
you know, not the, the predator instinct isn't developed in all of us equally. Mm -hmm. That's for, that's for sure. Not all of us are violent and uh, in, to the same degree, although many times though they're capable of great violence, have a great um, power in their hands because they are able to face situations that are difficult and they have that meanness to survive. So again, again we, 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 it's a question of the beehive in which you live. In a, in a beehive where things are civil, do we need to be that aggressive? Do we need to have that meanness in store to use in case to protect us and our own? I don't know. I'm thinking of the three, the three great uh, sci-fi horrors of all time, uh, sort of like um, Alien and uh, The Thing, John Carpenter's mm -hmm. The Thing, and our Schwarzenegger's The Predator. Alien and Predator are the same, are about the same movie, you know, uh, the same message. One is about a ship that strays into hell to bring back uh, on orders of the corporate firm, um, a, a devil, which is who, as the robot in charge of the operation says, is not clouded by mo uh, delusions of morality, a survivor, and basically predators as a weapon. Mm -hmm. which is the ultimate for us, right? In this, in this race for survival, that's what you got to be. And in Schwarzenegger, the movie, which was not as stupid at all as it seemed, if you looked at it, and people cheered, where in fact it was, the moral of the story was that the true monster of the movie was Schwarzenegger himself, right? Mm -hmm. Because he was the only one who could defeat this monster who was preying on humans, and he defeats him. There's the scene where, you know, remember the last scene where he looks at the monster. I haven't the, seen it. I'll have to watch it. Yeah. And the monster, and he looks at, well, what the hell are you, asks Schwarzenegger. And the monster echoes, and what the hell are you? And mm -hmm. so, so it tells us that, you know, and it was the story about this spe special forces group who were basically, you know, cutthroats and who enjoyed the killing and who in the imaginary in, in the imaginary in the imagination of the collectivity are war heroes and they're basically butchers and john carpenter's the thing it's a different theme it's about this monster who can assume any kind of life form and uh, and so the whole story is about you don't ever know where the monster hides because he could be in the person that's sitting next to you and you thought is your friend but he's been copied by the monster and can erupt into this frightening abominable uh, countenance and start killing everybody and, 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 and swallowing you in horrifying ways and so on and so forth. And that I, I always, the movie always mesmerized me and I never understood why until I read it somewhere. I didn't, I didn't get it myself. And that movie is so powerful because it represents another theological fear of us that we're not sure about the goodness of our beginning as mm. the creation of the world because there's so much evil and cunning and malicious cunning in nature that we wonder who the creation of it all is. And sometimes we fear, and also the story that we talked about, and remember about, we don't know who ourselves are. And so we mm -hmm. wear these masks. And so the story is about imposters taking other people's places and the wife not knowing. Remember we talked about, and you mm -hmm. said there was a, you mentioned a musical that told the same story. And I was mentioning in Shasha, yeah, yeah, it's Martin Gare. It's also the American movie would be the Civil War one with Jodie Foster called uh, Summersby. Yep. All right, exactly. I have yeah. to watch that movie. Yeah, yeah. Same thing. So mm -hmm. in 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 John Carpenter, John Carpenter's The Thing, the monster you don't long you no longer know if the person in front of you is human or not because the monster can assume the guise of anybody, mm. and it goes back to this. So what are we? What, you know, we're just expressions of flesh animated by this spirit or this, this soul, which is a deeply malevolent one. And this goes back to the other two movies, the, predate, the predators or not. And when and all these talks about possession and about the psyche and so on and so forth, what do they really mean? And what, what is the principle of life animating all this manifestation of horror? And the message of Bataille, which was the other thinker that greatly occupied me, was that evil is a willing agency with its own mind. It's not that nonsense that the theologian oh, theologian was saying yeah, yeah. of absence of good. Not at all. It's something self-contained with a very defined will 
and that goes on horrifying and scaring the bejesus out of us in this life uh, in ways that have method to them. And so what does that say about creation, even in an original sin? And I am saying, if you want to begin to unravel this thing in creating the alternative nest, you got to grapple with all these issues at once. And mm -hmm. most people are just not willing or equipped to do it because they're all they're set in their old ways and saying, well, you know, because they are still, most of them are still very much entrenched and comfortable in the beehive in which they are, although they sense that a lot of things are not right, but they don't, it, it takes a lot. It takes mm -hmm. a lot of energy and it's really difficult of breaking out of the cocoon and seeking a new, uh, a new ground. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is why most, most people don't do it because it's too, it's just too taxing. It's, um, it's too daunting. Right, right. It's too scary. Mm -hmm. We've traversed a lot of uh, areas here, <laughs> as always. I uh, tell people, um, you know, and this would, uh, you know, your your concept of the machine again. You have, um, you know, technology began as kind of Apollonian, you know, just tools, and then something else, and you know, something you're making kind of distinct is that. You know, you use the word the clubs again. You know, this is useful to the clubs and it's being deployed where some people think it is this machine that runs on its own. You're being quite emphatic that, no, this is this is kind of a game. This is a structure that's run by uh, the engineer of all engineers, kind of these clubs, yeah. these well, angle. Yeah, as, you, as you said, it, it's tools. It's yep. and, and these are very sophisticated tools. But even, you know, even even with beautiful tools, I mean, you can hurt somebody. Right. But, mm -hmm. you know. Likewise with technology, but per se the tool, and we know this, but it's not, you know, Heidegger is also where it's neutral. Neutral, it's not that technology is new. Yeah, neutral, you could say that, but it's, it, that's, that's not, it's not even the point. It's right, an artifact. Right. It's, mm -hmm. it's an artifact. Yep. And, and yeah, we may wonder where, 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 where did it come from? All this technique. Mm -hmm. Good question. Answer, we don't know. Right. We right, absolutely right. don't know. Mm -hmm. But, you know, speaking of obfuscation, obfuscating this whole development, which is mysterious to us with stories of demons uh, uh, swallowing us whole and so on, it's nonsense because, because, it, because somebody's in charge of those passwords. Right, right, right. And again, I think what a point that interests me is we, we, we gotta be as precise as we can about this machine. And again, we would say for me, we can get precise. Will we ever understand it all? No, no, no. But I think the more precise we get, just like you know, the machine plays on, say, our left brain, and makes it hypertrophy and deflates, you know, deflates the right brain, kind of the intuitive thing. There's always these push and pull factors. So for me, say, reading your work um, and also reading King's North and so forth, when we can get at what's going on, this question of like what's actually going on, a, uh, it doesn't make you so cynical. Like you seem like an upbeat guy. I'm an upbeat guy. Um, and I, I would tend to be angry if I wasn't asking, like, what the hell's going on? I'd also, when I find out that it's really overwhelming, I think it probably gives me a sense of humor, or I, I kind of know where I end and other things begin, that, that question of interest that came from Dr. Faustus. But, uh, you know, one of the great things about this examination of the machine, for me, theologically, is I think the more precise we can be about what's going on, we know, again, just one theme of the Regeneration podcast is that the Catholic Church, for one, seems to be dying one of its periodic deaths in our time. And if we're, you know, let's say we have the faith of Chesterton, that it, it always kind of resurrects. You know, what will it look like? I think it's going to find its shape when it, we find kind of the key to this machine. You know, right now it's trying to find its shape in the culture wars or in the political wars of conservative and liberal and so forth. And this is just going to lead to more death. And just boredom, maybe even worse than death is boredom. But I find that when we continue to kind of analyze the machine and the question, where am I? The, the question that God asked Adam in Genesis and the question we need to ask ourselves right now, what is going on? It will, it kind of shapes us that the answer will be like, where is Christ in our time? What is the gospel saying to us in our time? But the reason I brought up Pope Benedict is, uh, you know, mad respect for him, what a cultured mind, 
what an intelligent guy. But our social critique from within the church, you know, we have all this theology and so forth. It's still very rudimentary, right? Do you see any exceptions to that, Guido? No, I, I, I don't know it as well as you, I, um, for one. And It was um, nice for you to, you mentioned like Piggy and Bernanos is having things. I mean, there's great resources in our tradition, but right now, is anybody saying things super intelligent about this? I'm not finding it. I'm finding you and go ahead. No, no, what I was, no, what I was at the, at the what I was, at the Gregorian, I was, I was appalled by the, the, the low, low intellectual level. Yeah. And even when talking with, with, with Catholics, you know, and you know this, you know, and all they were getting really, they were really twitchy about was liturgy and, and homosexuality. And I mean, yeah, there's a bigger game being played. The bigger issues, they seem to be completely irrelevant to them. So I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's all they talk about. Tell, yeah, tell people about your, again, one more. Some of your books will be coming out around the same time as you believe your website will be up. But we have the, I'm going to put the link to your website in development. Will they find something online now saying in construction or is it not even? Yeah, yeah. Page? It's just, it's one page. It's called Ad Triarios, two words. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a subscribe. And so if you put your name there, uh, once the whole thing is relaunched properly with all the materials and everything, you will uh, uh, get all the information. And I'm going to make all my, um, I'm going to upload all my articles and everything is, is free. There were a few for sale, very few articles for sale back in the day where I was um, hoping I could, uh, I could uh, sustain myself with that, but turned out not to have been a good proposition. So I'm just going to make as That's I've how always, we met, Guido. I was trying to download an article. I forget where I came across your name, and it wasn't I working. Then I just I, wrote I, you I, I'm proud to say that I refunded you those five bucks because you did. You um, absolutely did. <laughs> and um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, anyway, it was just anyway, it was something we tried. But um, when I when I, I when I left the university, but anyway, yeah. so right now uh, everything is just going to be there. Um, lots of stuff, uh, uh, easily freely downloadable, and the new books coming. And um, and yeah, so I look forward to that. I'm impaginating them and uh, I have to work out some graphics, but they should be on Amazon soon. And, and if that takes oh. off, uh, you know, probably God willing, we'll sell them on our own. But anyway, right. and make them reasonably priced and so on. We had uh, going back, we had Michael and I had John one time and we called the episode Empire and Church One. When that book comes out, we'll do Empire and Church Two. And then, Great, uh, thank you. you know, I think we'll get into the one on 9-11 too. I think they're, they're all fascinating. And then we'll do, you know, uh, time is infinite. We'll, uh, we'll get into conjuring Hitler too. It's, it's a, your, your most famous book. We haven't really talked about it much. That'll be fun. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, we don't, well, uh, this has been great. Everybody, any other comments? Uh, no, great. No, it's, it's been, it's good. I thank you for uh, everything. Sure thing. Thank you for everybody for listening to the regeneration podcast. We will see you again. Next week, Mike Martin, if you hear this, I hope you're kind of pulling out of the uh, the powerless day or days. And uh, I'm sure Mike will be with us next week as well. See you, everybody.